Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Hello, everyone. I'm Troy Moling, and thanks for joining us today on Market Journal. Hey, good to see you. Lots to cover this week, including an interview with our market analyst, the impacts of politics on trade, weather with Al, and a whole lot more. We begin, though, with a story for our cattle producers watching. When buying new bulls for the upcoming season, there's some things you may want to do before putting them in the pasture. South Dakota State University Extension cow-calf field specialist Taylor Grussing has a checklist for managing your new bulls and helping them succeed. So when we bring new bulls home to an operation, it's usually a good idea to adjust them from a concentrate ration to a more forage-based ration, as they won't be getting delivered feed in a feed bunk anymore. And when we turn them out to pasture, obviously they'll need to be able to travel, uh, maintain weight, and get their nutrients out of the grass. And so adjusting them to more of a forage-based ration is one of the first things we want to do leading up to the breeding season. And we also want to keep them gaining weight at about one and a half half to two pounds a day, which will hopefully set them up to a body condition score of a six as we go into the breeding season. The bulls also need to get accustomed to each other to ensure they spend more time breeding and less time fighting. Anytime we bring new bulls to an operation, we always want to make sure that they are adjusted to each other. And so this should take place prior to the breeding season in a structurally sound pen. So that way they can kind of determine the pecking order of themselves as younger yearling bulls may not get along with the older mature bulls. And also when we go to turn them out to pasture then, we can consider doing pasture breeding situations with maybe multiple yearling bulls in a pasture together, or we can have some of the mature bulls only in a pasture together. So that way we aren't having maybe some of that social dominance issues. But we also know that sometimes we only buy one or two yearling bulls a year and we need to mix them with mature bulls. So as long as they've seen each other and kind of adjusted to each other before the breeding season, hopefully we'll have a success pregnancy rate. Taylor suggests watching the new bulls while they're in their pens as well as getting them checked over by a veterinarian at least two months before breeding season. Structural integrity of the bulls is very important to assess prior to the breeding season as well as through the entire breeding season as we need them to be physically fit um, and sound on their feet and legs in order to travel the pastures and breed the cows successfully. Uh, we can start assessing this in large um, pens if they're in the dry lot prior to the breeding season, uh, but we also want to make sure the veterinarian is checking that out during their breeding soundness exam. Breeding soundness exams should take place at least 30 days if not 60 days ahead of the breeding season season. This is because the spermatogenesis process takes 60 days to occur, so any kind of injury or insult that may have happened 60 days ago could be affecting the semen quality of those bulls. And so if you can assess if the bulls are in good semen quality ahead of the breeding season, then we will have time um, to replace bulls if they do not pass the breeding soundness exam, or also just have the confidence that going into the breeding season your bulls are ready to go. Taylor also stresses that the breeding soundness exam is very important because it will ensure the bulls are viable and ready to be bred. The breeding soundness exam will assess the physical confirmation of the bulls as well as the semen quality with motility and morphology. So as I mentioned, they'll assess the vision, smell, legs of the bulls as well as measure their reproductive organs or palpate their reproductive organs. And then they'll also take a semen sample and this will assess the motility and the morphology of the semen quality. And bulls need to have at least a 30% motility score to pass a breeding soundness exam. And that's with progressive head first movement of those sperm cells. And then they also need a 70% morphology score to pass the exam. And this is with normal sperm cells that would be physically, physically capable of um, fertilizing the ovum. So they have to have a 30% and a 70% to pass. And if they don't, they can be retested in two to four weeks to potentially allow um, new semen to mature. Uh, but also, if they, if they fail, then they can hopefully be replaced by that breeder before the breeding season starts. For more information on introducing new bulls to your operation, contact your local extension office.
Reporting for Market Journal, I'm Maddie McIntosh. Thanks, Maddie. Taylor says following this checklist will help breeders ensure their bulls are ready to go for the season and help to avoid potential revenue loss. Looking at markets now, and harvest for Nebraska soybeans has been complete for a couple weeks now. As for corn, the latest USDA crop progress report has corn harvested at 96 percent, near the 99 percent from last year and the five-year average. All that while corn basis remains hot, and the increase in corn demand has been on the upswing too. I was joined by Tradeos's Doug Simon on Wednesday to get his take. Numbers we're getting from USA. I don't, you know, we're going to see final numbers in, in January when they come out with that report. You know, I was up by Wahoo yesterday, and there's one person I saw picking corn, but for the most part, you know, Nebraska's done on soybeans. There's a little bit left to be picked, maybe out west in some different areas. But uh, you know, when you look at the the national numbers, there's still quite a bit of corn. Probably about 66 percent completed up in Michigan, Wisconsin, but South Dakota, North Dakota, there's still quite a bit of corn to come out there. There's about, I think, one point. 2 billion bushels that's left out in the field and we're going to carry over 1.9 billion bushels. So there's still quite a bit of corn out there relative to what we're supposed to carry over. You know, beans were, were maybe 100 million that are left out in the field and we're supposed to carry over 400 and what, 75 million bushels. So we're, we're down to about maybe 25% of what we're going to carry over. So beans not as big a concern, but there's still, you know, a bit of corn up there, especially in North Dakota. And I think you mentioned on the show a time or two, corn basis, it's hot. It's still so, hot. Yeah, so is it, it one of those, to be hot. Yeah. yeah, is it one of those things where we need to take advantage of these prices now or hold off on it, wait to see if it gets better? What do you think? I think we've had a pretty good run. When you look at historical movement and basis, let's start with beans. Beans were 75 under the Nove, and when there was 15 cents a carry to the Jan, you know, that's basically a 90 under the Jan. Let's call it that. Bean basis has come into 35 under the, the Jan now currently. So we've improved 60 cents on bean basis. So our carryover is a half of you know what it was last year. We were up you know almost a billion. We're gonna be at 475 million bushel carryover. So it would argue that our bean basis level should be better, but they've made a pretty dramatic run. And typically by you know that Thanksgiving to Christmas time frame, you do see a really good as Roy Smith likes to call it a dead cat bounce, mm -hmm. you know, and so we've had a nice, you know, bounce in the basis. The, unfortunately, the futures have fallen off here in the same time frame, and part of that basis improvement is trying to draw beans out of the country. The other side of it, corn, you know, we were in the 10 to 15 to 20 under basis levels up at Columbus at harvest time. There, you know, we were just, um, we've rolled, everybody's rolled from the D's contract to the March. There was anywhere from 10 cents a carry. There was up to 12, you know, a few weeks ago, but when you look at the basis levels right now, there are three under the march. Uh, with that 12 cents a carry, that's basically a nine over the dece. So we've had a pretty, you know, good improvement in that basis level again. Uh, you know, like good post-harvest bounce. So, yeah, we're we're starting to move some. You know, want to core out some of the tops of bends and, and move some corn here. The futures prices aren't very good. So the pre-harvest stuff that we sold earlier, whether we did hedge derives or hedges, you know, we can lift those and, and lock that basis in and take advantage of it. Uh, the carries have started to tighten up in that dece to March on the corn, March to May, May to July. Uh, those things have tightened up, which is also an indication of this market is, you know, not as well supplied as it would like to be, and and it's trying to draw corn out you know, through that basis through those tightening spreads. And then as we get into November, it looks like there was a little bit of an increase in corn demand. Why do you think that is? Well, I, I think, you know, when you look at last year, though, those numbers are not going to change a whole lot. I just think that, you know, we've had better ethanol margins here. Like last year, 2018, our ethanol margins were pretty much negative through all the first part of the year. Since harvest, you know, this first quarter of the marketing year, we've actually been, you know, just at neutral or slightly you know, or positive margins. In fact, they've improved you know, here this last week. But so that's encouraging for the ethanol side of it. Um, one interesting thing is like the cattle numbers. I was looking at that. We had cattle on feed last week and we've got the largest cattle on feed numbers in eight years. And we've got mm. feed use. And when you look at that, it's actually flat from where it was two years ago. We're actually down 300 million bushels on feed use from last year. We went from 5.6 billion down to 5.3 billion. But we've had a 5% increase in red meat and poultry production over the last two years. There's something not jiving there for me because we ought to be seeing higher feed demand, I think, as well. Um, you know, last year you could see maybe feed demand was a little bit higher because of the, you know, really cold conditions and we had to feed a lot more feed to get the pounds of meat, but um, something not jiving in there. So when we look forward, we're gonna have the WASRI report in, in January. There's a lot of pieces of this puzzle I think they're gonna be trying to put together because remember back in, in September, we had that big drop in the stocks number. 
Well, they're also doing a stocks evaluation right now that will come out in the January report. And they'll come up with their new supply and demand tables. They'll look at production and acres, come up with those numbers. So there's a lot of pieces that got to come together, but they still got to address why those stocks were lower in September, probably because that crop from 2018 was overstated, but also maybe they're underestimating feed demand. So there's a lot of pieces that have to come together. It's gonna to be interesting to see what that January report looks like, uh, but we still kind of expect maybe they'll cut those yields, maybe a bushel or two. Uh, maybe those acres maybe will be down, maybe there'll be, some, maybe there'll be some positive surprises in there. Is there a certain report that before it comes out, you're like, all right, this is the one I'm really excited for for the year? Uh, what, how does that work? Well, excitement or nervousness or, uh, Either or one. volatility. When you have a January report that's got stocks numbers and S&Ds and we've had you know a very wet year and there's a lot of uncertainty and doubt about USDA's counting of acres and yields, yeah, this will be the, big, the biggest. Uh, you know, we thought maybe the October and November reports would be big, but this will, this will definitely be a, a, a big one in that regard. Thanks to Doug for being here. Be sure to stop by and see him at the Trados booth during next week's Nebraska Power Farming Show. Next week, we'll head over to Briggs Feed Yard to get a check on the cattle markets with Mike Briggs. So if you have a question you'd like for me to ask him, email us or get in touch on social media, and I'll pass your question along. Next up, we mentioned this a few weeks back, but we want to tell you about it again. University of Nebraska Extension, in collaboration with the Nebraska FSA, are hosting a series of Farm Bill education meetings this month in order to give producers the opportunity to learn more about the similarities and differences in programs like ARC and PLC. The 2018 Farm Bill signed into law last December reauthorized the existing agricultural risk coverage and price loss coverage safety net programs that were in the 2014 Farm Bill. However, producers will need to make a new program enrollment decision in the months ahead. These meetings will help producers understand the programs, recent changes, and decisions to be made. As we noted, this is a, the same program that producers had a decision on back in 2014 in the last Farm Bill. Uh, the decision between ARC and PLC at that time, uh, but the environment is very different today. Uh, we are coming off of high prices in 2014 and the relative support in the ARC program made it quite popular with uh, producers, particularly with corn and soybean producers. Now we're coming off of and dealing with lower prices and the relative support between ARC and PLC changes and so producers have to look at it more carefully before they simply say uh, the, the decision I made last time is still good. The same token we expect a substantial shift in enrollment decisions but it's not as easy as saying I know what I want to do I should just go do it. Uh, it's, we're at levels where it's important to actually look at the analysis and make, a, make an informed decision. If you haven't attended a meeting yet, there are still lots of chances this month. Some upcoming ones are December 9th in West Point, December 11th in Scribner, December 12th in Humboldt and Ogallala, and December 16th in Lincoln. For more information and registration, you can visit farmbill.unl.edu. A link to the list is on the Market Journal website, too. Next up, Ron and Sherry Heskett were farming traditional crops, but now they own and operate a vineyard, winery, and distillery. The move into viticulture happened over the course of many years. They planted 900 new vines this past year, taking the vine count up to 5,000 at Whiskey Run Creek Vineyard and Distillery in Brownville. In addition, the family built a new distillery in 2017 and produced its first vodka in 2018. Over time, the Heskits hope to process and market an apple brandy, as well as rum and whiskey, true to the vineyard's name. Read about the Heskits and their winery and distillery in the December Nebraska Farmer. It's now time for weather with Nebraska Extension Ag Climatologist and Market Journal Chief Meteorologist Al Dutcher. Now we're into the home stretch of 2019. How's everything look out there? Well, Troy, yes we are. We're into the last month of the year and it's been a terrible year for much of the center part of the country due to all the flooding and of course here in Nebraska the major flooding event as we've seen last March and then a continuation of planting delay issues. Lots of rain this summer. We had some very difficult times in terms of getting uh, our pastures harvested and hayed up properly. Low quality forage, problems with rain as we got in toward the harvest period, an extended harvest period. Now we're dealing with some of these snowstorms and now the cold air is coming in. So I think we'd all like to say good riddance to 2019. We only have about a little over three and a half weeks to go, 
But overall, as we go through this next seven day period, I think the major emphasis for the state of Nebraska is going to be just the cold temperatures. And if we go to the upper air models, what it will draw your attention to is that we have a large trough to the west, have a ridging in the center part of the country, and we have some Arctic air to the north that is going to start to surge down toward the later half of the weekend. In the meantime, it doesn't look to be too bad of a weekend. Low pressure at the surface stacks up in eastern Montana and southeastern portions of Colorado. No moisture to bring evicted northward. Most of it is confined to the western United States. By the time we get to Sunday, though, that energy starts to move into the southwest and drives out a trough, and then we see the reinforcing cold air trying to move in from the north. Low pressure tries to develop in southeastern Colorado and the Texas Big Bend region, but most of the activity will still be confined into the inner mountain region. But by Monday, this trough starts to move out and we get the cold air surging into the central plains. That brings cold air high into our region, pushes most of the major storm activity to our south, low pressure developing in Texas. We'll start to energize and move up into the eastern United States. We see some flurry activity across eastern Nebraska, but we see major snowstorm in the northeast. And then on Tuesday, very cold air sets up across the center part of the country as high pressure basically in control from the Canadian border to the Gulf of Mexico. A little bit of light snow is showing. I think this might be overdone on Tuesday, but more importantly on Wednesday, we do get a little bit of relief as this trough moves off rather quickly. We get kind of a zonal flow, so we'll get a little bit of warming as we get into the Wednesday time period. Back to closer to normal. Low pressure once again tries to develop in southeastern Colorado. We do have a low pressure moving into the Pacific Northwest, spreading some flurry activity. But on Thursday, as we start to see this trough moving in, it builds a ridge, and that also means that on the east side of the rock as we start to build another trough, polar air starts to filtrate back in. Low pressure developing in eastern Montana may slide toward the south, generating some flurry activity across eastern Nebraska and the Dakotas. And more importantly, as this ridge builds even farther north, bigger cold air mass starts to move toward the south. Here's that low pressure system in the uh, Nebraska Panhandle expected to kind of move and then re-engenerize this active pattern toward the east. So we left high and dry with a major activity once again to our east. And again, we're looking at another major storm next weekend across the northeastern United States. For us, we'll probably hold the cold air in at least through next weekend. If we look at the 8 to 14 day forecast, they are indicating from next Thursday following Tuesday that the cold air will shift to our east, but I am seeing signs that we will continue to see the cool air spill into our region. So I think we're going to be closer to normal to slightly below normal as the warm air remains in the western United States as the ridge starts to build northward. In terms of precipitation, I have a hard time believing this forecast in terms of precipitation for Nebraska. We may see that above normal across the northern plains, but it doesn't look like any active patterns are going to impact the vast majority of the state unless this system slides right down the eastern side of the Rockies late next week. Otherwise, most of the activity is going to slide into Texas, then move up the eastern seaboard for a very aggressive precipitation pattern. So overall, Troy, it looks like some very cold air for the next week, but overall we're not expecting any major storm activity, at least here in Nebraska. Thanks, Al. Next up, trade has been in the headlines this past year, from the trade war with China to the holdup with the USMCA to a trade agreement in principle with Japan. And it all boils down to one thing. Trade policy will usually be a painstaking and time-consuming endeavor. And while the numbers say the grueling work that goes into trade is worth the effort, the politics of trade bear out a barrage of challenges in going from a trade proposal to a trade deal. This week, Bill Dodd sat down with Extension Policy Specialist Brad Lubin to discuss the intricacies in the politics of trade. Bill, what have you got for us today? Thanks, Troy. You know, whoever said good things come to those who wait was probably a trade expert of some sort. It's been an interesting year in trade, to say the least, and it's been a very uncertain time for producers, as we've seen both the economics and politics of trade hinder progress all too frequently. Now, through this process, it's easy to see why trade is so important and such a politically sensitive topic for many folks in the ag industry. Since the turn of the century, U.S. ag exports have grown from $51 billion to $140 billion in recent years, before a sharp drop-off the past two years due to falling prices and escalating trade conflicts. Estimated ag exports from Nebraska have followed a similar trend from about $2.3 billion in the year 2000 to over $7 billion in recent years before falling back to about $6.3 billion in 2017 and lower trade projections for 2018 and 2019. Much of this can be attributed to trade woes that have diminished exports as well as farm income prospects from commodity-intensive production states such as Nebraska. We know the statistics that say Nebraska agriculture is about one of every four jobs or one in every four dollars of output in the state. 
Uh, and much of that Nebraska uh, ag income comes from trade prospects. Our commodity-driven production system uh, is sending commodities across the, the globe, uh, and so increasingly trade has been an important driver of Nebraska farm prospects and in turn the Nebraska general economy. In that environment, with an increased reliance on and importance of trade, we see the increased uncertainty of continuing trade conflicts at present. Uh, and it has led to quite a bit of uncertainty in the markets, which in turn have impacted uh, farm income prospects for the state. We've witnessed negotiations in the World Trade Organization stall out time and time again, causing a slight rift in world trade politics, making it harder to maintain a global trade policy. However, regional trade tends to move along at a much smoother pace. Negotiating agreements with the, tr with the countries you already trade with seems to be easier than trying to negotiate an agreement that all countries in the world can sign off on. So we've seen increased growth in regional trade agreements, which do offer prospects uh, and some continued opportunities for, for trade for the United States. But then we've seen the conflicts now over the last couple of years. Um, there was trade negotiations on, a, on the, what was called the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP agreement that really would have set a trade framework and something of a strategic relations framework in the Pacific Rim region. Uh, but and when uh, President Trump was elected the office, that was one of the first acts of the new administration, was to withdraw from that agreement. Recognize that we're now hoping for uh, a, a finalization of an agreement with Japan, an announced agreement, but terms and details yet to be worked out, that gets us much of, but maybe not all of, what we would have had with Japan had we signed the TPP agreement a couple years ago. While things are moving slowly but surely with trade in the Pacific Rim region, we don't have to look back too far in the past to see how some disputes and problems have played out with other trade partners in the European Union, for example. It was only in 2003 that the U.S. lost global beef markets, seemingly overnight, due to a case of bovine spongiform encephalopathy and had to work for the better part of a decade on scientific and political negotiations. With the finding of BSE uh, was announced in the United States back in 2003. Beef markets effectively disappeared, beef export markets effectively disappeared overnight because the U.S. was no longer a BSE-free country. Well, as we investigated and determined the source of the cow and determined the extent of the, uh, of the infection and effectively controlled it, um, we regained our status as a reliable supplier of beef. But we didn't regain those markets as quickly. Uh, the fact that markets were taken away overnight it had to become, it, and it did become, a, a very long-running effort to try and regain market access in different countries at different times as they ultimately either A, relax their, their tight restrictions, or B, recognized the international designation of the U.S. as a, as a reliable supplier again of beef. And, uh, and only now do we see some of the growth back into those markets that were previously really lost overnight. Uh, to a case of BSE. Earlier this year, an even older beef with the European Union dating back to the 1980s finally found some common ground. The celebrated agreement with the EU to increase the share of access for U.S. exports of non-hormone-fed beef was a welcome development in the decades-long dispute. After a victory with the World Trade Organization in 1996, the U.S. still could not convince the EU to drop their ban on added hormones in livestock production and imports. While this current deal isn't necessarily a slam dunk for beef producers across the U.S., the significance is still quite tangible. Uh, it's an important component of growth, even if it is for non-hormone fed beef, which is not the, the predominant uh, share of the production sector, but at least it is uh, an opportunity for growth and an opportunity for trade. Uh, so increasingly, we see uh, more effort and, and uh, more opportunity for trade, and some of this comes as a result of sort of generally improving and liberalizing trade relations and much of it comes as a result of very specific negotiations one country to another over the specific rules and, and ramifications for, for trade. But it all takes a continued and concerted effort at uh, building and improving and growing trade prospects over time. While it's fairly plain to see the benefits of trade, it's also abundantly clear that trade negotiations and disputes can be a time-consuming venture to resolve. Now, the moral of the story here is good things may come to those who wait, and as we anxiously await the outcome of negotiations with one of our most lucrative trading partners in China, time will ultimately tell if our patience has been worth our while. And Troy, that's what I've got my eye on this week. We'll send it back to you. Thanks, Bill.
Finally today, backgrounding is the growing phase following weaning up until a calf goes to the feedlot. Producers might look to background calves in order to capture some extra weight gain while not adding fat. Additionally, backgrounding allows you to market the calves when the timing is more favorable. Extension beef educator Aaron Labry says a backgrounding program can be anywhere from 60 days to six months. So backgrounding programs are going to vary greatly among the operation. It's going to come down to what that producer's goal is um, and when they want to market those calves. Um, different things like what feed resources they have available that they can market through those calves um, and what their desired uh, average daily gain is for those calves. Uh, if you have corn silage available that you could feed in a total mix ration and, and you have the equipment and the facilities available to uh, deliver a uh, total mix ration to those calves, you could do that. Um, there's al always the option of grazing corn residue and annual forages. Um, and also with the grass production we've had this year, you could graze them on native winter range and supplement them with some distiller's grains. A backgrounding diet is typically more forage based and therefore lower in energy than our traditional feeding or finishing diets. Um, and so like I said, maybe if you want to grow those calves at a half a pound a day, you could graze them on native winter range and supplement one and a half pounds of distiller's grains. Or if you want to grow them more around two and a half pounds per day, you could feed them a corn silage based diet uh, with some distillers as well. Aaron also says that if you're considering retaining ownership and backgrounding those calves, it's important to evaluate the cost of gain versus the value of gain and whether that's cost effective for your operation. That's about going to do it for this week's show, but before we go, make sure you stop by the Market Journal booth at next week's Nebraska Power Farming Show. We'll be there handing out prizes, meeting viewers, and even getting some interviews too. It all takes place December 10th, 11th, and 12th at the Lancaster Event Center right here in Lincoln. Hope to see you there. And until next time, I'm Troy Moling. Thanks for watching. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources.